Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to working session 18, discussion of uh, human dimension activities uh, with a special emphasis on project work. Uh, my name is Luc Litar. I'm the project coordinator uh, at ODIR and will be your moderator for this session. Uh, this is almost traditionally now uh, the last working session of the Human Dimension meeting. Uh, so I call it the home stretch, the final leg, um, and also a very short uh, leg at that. And I think some of you might actually be grateful for that. Uh, it's been a long two weeks and maybe also a long evening yesterday. Uh, so we have exactly uh, one, one hour uh, before the stage is set. Um, for the closing. So I will therefore also keep uh, my introduction very, very short. Um, maybe some of you who have been here before know that this session also usually has a slightly different format than other working sessions. Uh, and that's not going to be different uh, now. So instead of having a formal introducer, we will try to offer you a very rich uh, palette of project activities uh, undertaken by a number of field operations from across the OSC region. Um, the presentations will focus uh, on projects as a tool to help participating states achieve the human dimension commitments. And they will highlight good practice, uh, lessons learned, and cooperation with both um, external counterparts and also between um, OEC executive structures. Uh, we are very happy that our invitation was taken up by no less than six uh, field operations, uh, for whom we have the representatives here with us. Uh, that does make it a bit challenging uh, time-wise, and, and I also hope the technology is, is kind to us because we have quite a bit of visual support for this and also one presenter calling in via WebEx, so we hope that goes well. Um, um, yeah, on well, the speakers list, we have for the time being uh, only three speakers, so we should have uh, sufficient uh, time to make it in one hour. But of course, uh, feel free to still, I think, you can still sign up um, to be added to the speakers list. So then actually, without um, further ado, I would like to hand over to the first uh, presenter, if we can establish the connection, and uh, that would be with our colleague uh, Isabella Hartmann, uh, Human Dimension Officer in the Program Office in Astana. Um, if that's... Okay, we'll so we, we may have to try, I um, sound like a uh, broadcaster in the news studio, we might have to try later since the connection doesn't seem to be established yet. Um, maybe just a few seconds to see if we can do it now or whether we proceed with another presentation first. Uh, Okay, so we'll, we'll try again uh, later. So then I would um, hand over, maybe still stay in the, in the region since we're going to start with uh, the office in Astana, move to the, a little bit southeast, to the program office in Bishkek, uh, where we have um, Vladimir Rakocevic with us, Human Dimension Officer. Uh, I'm happy to give the floor to you, please. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, civil society representatives, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Capitalizing on results achieved in the Human Dimension Program over the past six years in the Program Office in Bishkek, uh, the project sought to strengthen capacities of the state institutions and civil society to effectively promote gender equality, address gender-based violence, and tackle early marriages and bright kidnapping. Specifically in line with the core principles of human security, the emphasis was in designing people-centered, comprehensive, multi-sectoral, context-specific, and prevention-oriented activities. For that matter, such interventions aimed at empowering women uh, and men to build resilient communities that in turn benefit from the government's protection-oriented programs. In furtherance of our objective to strengthen the role of women as conflict prevention uh, agents, the office engaged with 29 women initiative groups consisting of 122 influential women to provide training courses uh, on conflict mediation, victim protection, outreach, and networking. While the project idea was prompted by the need to empower women to become an um, active part of decision making in the communities, the project went beyond the need to establish an early warning network. To promote sustainability of the action, uh, the project focused on helping uh, women initiative groups progressively develop into a community resource to effectively address socioeconomic vulnerability issues and to be used as a standing mechanism to diffuse tensions and prevent crisis. 
while a number of agreements and memoranda of understanding attest to the success, more should be done to institutionalize the work of women's networks and help them become sustainable and full-fledged women resource centers. In parallel, the office partnered with NGO Child Rights Defenders League to offer a set of training courses on leadership, social entrepreneurship, human rights and mechanisms for their protection to 60 teenage girls and their families from remote districts in three provinces with high rates of early marriages. Owing to the generous support from local authorities, schools and business community, the NGO partner forged cross-sectoral uh, partnerships in addressing common threats to human security in Kyrgyzstan. To that end, successful women entrepreneurs were invited to share their experiences and views on how to turn business ideas into action. In retrospect, thanks to the efforts made by the state of institutions and civil society over years, two major pieces of legislation were enacted, namely on tackling early marriages and domestic violence, which strengthened the mechanism for prevention thereof, as well as protection of victims. Finally, to, ha to harness the momentum and ensure a positive impact in the long run, OSU should continue to take into account the priorities of the host authorities and civil society in furtherance of political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights of all Kyrgyzstanis. Broadly put, both ODIR and field operations should contribute more to the advancement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda in concert with our partners in the field. To achieve that, joint efforts must be made to strengthen the organization's monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. In conclusion, I invite you to take stock of a short video clip titled, My Plea to You, created by our teenage girl, be uh, girl beneficiaries for the last year's 16 days of activism against gender-based violence campaign. Just for your information, the video is in the Russian language, but the English subtitles will be provided. Thank you so much. Привет, я Гуля, мне 16 лет, и я смогла убедить моих родителей не выдавать меня замуж до моего совершеннолетия. Это мое письмо для тех девочек, кому еще нет 18. Я недавно узнала, что в нашей республике были насильно выданы замуж более 6 тысяч несовершеннолетних девушек в возрасте до 15 лет. Ранний брак – это трагедия для нас, ведь девочки не могут окончить школу. Они не получают среднее специальное или высшее образование. Ранний брак очень часто сопровождается насилием. Ранний брак приводит к ранней беременности, но так как подростковый организм еще не готов к этому, часто погибает и молодая мама, и ее малыш. Врачи говорят, что в группе до 18 лет самая высокая материнская смертность. Девушки, рано вышедшие замуж, не защищены законом, потому что Нике в случае развода или смерти супруга, даже при наличии детей, не дает законных прав на наследство, алименты и пособия. Я очень рада, что появился закон, который запрещает свадебный обряд Нике и вводит уголовную ответственность для тех, кто вступает в брак с несовершеннолетними. Родители и священнослужители за совершение этого обряда также будут лишать свободы до пяти лет. Я уверена, что только получив образование, мы с вами сможем найти достойную работу, построить... We may have missed a little bit, but not much. I think it was a, a one-minute clip. So, uh, thank you very much, um, Vladimir, and thank you very much for an example of um, of an approach that has multiple components, uh, which we also see in a lot of our uh, for our field operations. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, I would then like to to pass the floor to um, Ambassador Verba, project coordinator, uh, the project coordination uh, project coordinator in in Ukraine. The floor is yours. Thank you, Luke. Well, this is a really good tradition that uh, field uh, missions are speaking at a very much closing day, and I think so, at least in my time, i always been here. So, uh, therefore, it's my third time, and I'm very thankful to you. Uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, the most visible part of the OC work in Ukraine is monitoring and reporting on the security situation. Th this is only natural given the conflict tremendous human cost and its place in international relations. 
At the same time, a founding principle of OEC is that sustainable security can only be achieved through a holistic, comprehensive approach, expressed through the numerous commitments in all three dimensions. I believe our counterparts in Ukraine recognize this in proper emphasis they place on ensuring the reform effort succeeds. And based on our partnerships, which continue to grow stronger, I believe they also recognize the unique position of the OEC project coordinator in Ukraine. These partnerships are manifested in our projects, of which we currently have more than 40 in all three dimensions. As we only have a limited time today, however, I'd like to highlight one of these projects where we had a recent success, reforming law school education. BPCU, for many years, promoted improved adherence to rule of law commitments, ranging from supporting dialogue and expert advice on reshaping the Supreme Court to help train the new police and many areas of assistance in between. An overreaching goal of the assistance is to promote a culture of rule of law. So we therefore include a strong emphasis on legal education. I believe many lawyers will tell you that it is in law school where they, their ethical IQ is developed alongside with the subject matter knowledge. On the positive side, institutions like student legal clinics and aspirational professors can help instill good ethics that will last for a person's career. At the same time, corrupt practices and lax standards can create cynicism that will be difficult, if not impossible, to correct once the student becomes a lawyer or perhaps later a judge or prosecutor. Aside from ethics, there is a course of the practical matter how to well prepared graduate students are to be lawyers. We know that Ukraine has a much higher number of law schools graduates than most of other European countries, five times to seven times more than in Poland or Germany, with two, three times more law schools than those countries. One reason Ukraine has so many law schools graduates, uh, it's likely that the standards for graduating are not high, not so uh, high trading quantity for quality, if, if, if you wish. To help support a positive dynamic in legal education, to create more ethical, better trained lawyers, the project coordinator's uh, office has been helping the ministries of education and justice introduce standards-based legal education in Ukraine. This has profound implications. By basing graduation exams on what the legal profession requires on new lawyers, not only, will, not only will students be judged on how well they, they absorb their lessons, but the law schools and law professors will be judged on how well they, their lessons themselves respond to real world needs. The PCU will be assisting schools on the standard graduation requirement in the near future. For now, the PCU has focused on the admission side. By developing and successfully launching this year a standard entrance exam for, a master, uh, for all master's law students nationwide. This is a major step in closing avenues for various forms of corruption and bias and ensures that all entering students will have a similar base, baseline of knowledge and helps prepare schools for further reform. This entrance exam was introduced this summer with 18,000 students taking uh, they, uh, taking it and three quarters passing. PCU is also working with the law schools and professors to improve the teaching materials and methodology. We have helped establish centers of excellence at Kiev Mohilo University, at Kharkiv National Law University, where leading schools and professors themselves will continue to further develop and refine law school education, effectively setting professional standards. We also support exchange of professors between the universities so that they can share the best practices in teaching methodology with their peers. This, this summer, we conducted a third annual training for the professors on interactive teaching methodology. We also support the development of, uh, of a range of textbooks that likewise help set standards. As one example, Last year, we, we supported the publication of the first textbook on legal theory, which helps students to explore the primary sources of law, which is essential for developing deeper ethical reasoning and understanding the nature of the rule of law. These steps taken together will help change the culture of law schools to become more result-oriented in sync, sync with the needs of the profession. In turn, they will produce lawyers who are better able to promote the rule of law 
which will have the ultimate effect of helping their country to improve its adherence to the fundamental OECE principles. To summarize, Ukraine's reform approach undertaken in close partnership with the PCU begins with standardized entry testing, emphasizes better teaching materials, methodologies, and, and applied practice, and when complete, will conclude with standardized testing to have access to legal profession. This, in turn, will have a positive impact on the overall legal and justice sector reform. We believe that this experience holds many lessons for the OEC participating states. Corruption in universities is, is an acknowledged phenomenon in several OEC countries. It not only erodes the quality of education, but it also instills a, a cynicism that will continue to have corrosive effects when the students become professionals. We would be happy to share our experience directly with other participating states through ODIR, bilaterally, or in some other appropriate manner, should we be requested. And therefore, I, I'd like to put a point here, and uh, obviously we're open for uh, all discussions, debates, and questions. Pedro. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for presenting an uh, initiative which is maybe uh, uh, less a typical um, OSC activity, but nevertheless one where, as an organization, we, we can still provide added value. Uh, and also thank you for your loyalty to this, uh, to this session. <coughs> um, that we would like to move on to um, a different region um, within the OSC and hand the floor to um, Fermin Cordoba, head of the Human Dimension Department uh, in the OSC mission uh, to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Fermin, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, your Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, dear colleagues, buenos dias, good morning. It is my pleasure to be here and thank you in advance for, for your time. What I will present today is uh, how we deal with, how do we address in the OSC mission to Bosnia-Herzegovina <coughs> a serious issue such as hate crimes, bias-motivated incidents, with the understanding that this has, can have a huge negative impact in the cohesion of society. I think that we all know that uh, how detrimental they can be for the social fabric. They represent a threat to stability uh, and the cohesion of communities. And in the context of, of Bosnia-Herzegovina, that is a critical aspect. Allow me just a very brief remark on, on, on the country, on the host country. Out of four million inhabitants, two million were forced to, to be displaced. The return process has been slow, although the property restitution process was a success, and here the OSC as an organization deserves to take credit. This was one of the great successes in Bosnia-Herzegovina of the international community, and in particular of the OSC, property restitution. However, following that uh, restitution of property, just few of them return. So what we have today is that uh, in majority of places there is one constituent group, either the Serbs from Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Croats, or the Bosniaks, which are the, the majority. So we are trying to uh, promote as much as possible reconciliation and uh, stability among those communities, in particular municipalities. So in that context, uh, hate crimes do represent a serious uh, threat. I'm not going to give a technical presentation. I'm just trying to present from an operational point of view how we are dealing with this issue. We've been moving from a traditionally rule of law based perspective to a wider, uh, a more comprehensive approach. Within the Human Dimension Department in the OSC Mission to Bosnia-Herzegovina, we have four projects, rule of law, education, democratic governance, and human rights. So uh, even if uh, how we are addressing hate crimes doesn't represent one single project, we are addressing this issue th through the perspective of these four projects. Before I go into the details, two things that I believe might be uh, interesting for you. One of our guiding principles here is the OSC Ministerial Council Decision 311 on early warning and conflict prevention. That was the tool that we utilized in order to pull resources from different projects to address hate crimes. And on the other hand, uh, audit methodology. I need to thank here to our audit colleagues because basically what we do from rule of law perspective, it is based on audit methodology. And I know that there are ongoing discussions on how to bring this issue forward. So I would like to use the occasion to thank our audit colleagues for that. What we do, basically there are three pillars. First one probably is uh, well, to monitor, of course. We do monitor, we collect inputs, we analyze the inputs, and we advocate. 
just to go beyond the rule of law perspective, what we are trying to do is, uh, through uh, also the international seconded to uh, to the mission, and I use also the occasion to remind on the importance of seconding strong candidates, because without strong candidates, what we do could be uh, an empty exercise. But uh, we are moving from rule of law perspective, so it's not just to talk to the police, it's not just to follow the incidents, how the incidents are being reported. This is also about shaping the environment. This is also about what is usually called soft diplomacy. Uh, our officer, our colleagues in the field, talking to the mayor, to school directors, to religious leaders, even to war veterans, whoever has a positive thing to say. So the idea is not just to focus on concrete bias-motivated incidents, but try to shape the environment and the environment to be one conducive to, to reconciliation. This is analysis, this is the more traditional rule of law approach. So based on the inputs that we collect, we analyze those inputs. Sometimes we publish uh, some reports. Those reports, through those reports, we use to identify gaps in the law enforcement agencies. So we can provide tailored capacity building uh, programs for law enforcement agencies. We are talking about police, judiciary, prosecutors, but also more recently with uh, civil society and in particular with, with the Roma community. On the other hand, we also use our public reports to advocate uh, for some legal reforms. In this case, it's essential that all criminal codes in Bosnia-Herzegovina are uh, harmonized, and so far that was not the case. So I have to say that thanks to our reports and our advocacy efforts, now there is a, I mean, legislation, different laws has, have been harmonized. Public awareness, that was essential. We were missing that people, we, we understood that people, they were not sufficiently informed about what was going on. So we have two tools. One is the hate monitor, which is uh, published every month, we just with data, because often people in the field, they have the impression that, okay, only my constituent is being targeted, what's going on with the others? So at least that helps to provide some clarity on, on what's going on. And on the other hand, we had this Super Grajanke, Super Grajani initiative. This is an online tool, an innovative tool, which also was shared with, with other field operations, uh, in which citizens, they can report bias-motivated incidents. They also, they can post their positive stories. And on the other hand, they can also seek uh, advice. Another element, it's uh, the work with civil society. So again, this is another example of moving just from the strictly rule of law perspective. <coughs> Coalitions against hate, against hate. We are talking about grassroots uh, NGOs. We are talking about 200 civil society organizations plus eight individuals in remote municipalities. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, yes, Sarajevo, Banja Luka, Mostar, they have quite solid NGO sector, but what's going on in those smaller municipalities? So what we try to do is to gather them, to try to help them to network, because they could be also a very positive agents promoting a, a message of peace and, and coexistence, reacting to hate-motivated incidents. So that's also essential. This is just a map to show you where we have uh, coalitions across across the country. Lessons learned, and I'm concluding with this. When it comes to the mission, it is essential essential to have a holistic cross-sectional approach, and this overcomes narrow con uh, operational views of different project managers who might be unwilling to deal with hate crimes from another perspective. It is essential that we don't deal just from a rule of law perspective, but for instance, when I'm referring here to soft diplomacy or shaping the environment, that we are able also to generate in the community, at the community level what we call also security forums. So security forums where we would gather uh, returnees, uh, local authorities, religious leaders, police. So it, it is useful also from a point of view of prevention and promotion of best practices and, and a message of peace and reconciliation, not just to react once an incident takes place, but also to try to be ahead of the game and facilitate that space for dialogue, which I believe is also very consistent with the very nature of, of our organization. I'm more than happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, I hope that this presentation was useful and maybe some field operations or even uh, colleagues from other uh, institutions may, may take some ideas from here. In concluding, just two very brief remarks. Uh, I was telling Ambassador Christian Strohal that we first time met 11 years ago when he was the director of ODIR, and I was here in my capacity of an NGO representative. That was 11 years ago. Now I'm here working, uh, well, representing the OSC mission to Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
modestly from the point of view of field operation, I do believe that these forums are a very useful tool. So thanks for continuing organizing them. Uh, of course, it can be an empty exercise, but on the other hand, it can be a meaningful exercise. I suppose it depends. Uh, it's up to us. And just to conclude, many thanks to the moderator, to Luke. We were colleagues in the OSI mission to Bosnia-Herzegovina. And as one national colleague told me, OK, if you are going to see Luke, please send him our regards. He's one of the few internationals who came here and did care about what was going on in the country. That is not the rule, not the exception, but let's be aware that not everybody uh, came with, with your intention and your, your commitment. So, Luke, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fermin, for your kind and unexpected uh, words. Uh, and also thank you for presenting, uh, yeah, again, a very, an example of a very comprehensive uh, approach over many years, cross-sectoral. I think that's the strength that we really have um, in the OSC. So, so thank you for that. Also very much appreciate the lessons learned. I think that's a slide that we could probably leave up a bit longer uh, to, to let it sink in. I think that's, that's really very important and also fully in line with the, with the purpose of this of this session, so thank you very much for that. So I'll, uh, I'll keep traveling uh, over the map, so let's go a little bit further southeast in the region, and then can also move over to my right, to your left, uh, and to Gonzalo de Cesare, head of the um, Human Dimension Department in the, uh, in the mission to Skopje. Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luke. Um, your Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends. Um, the Human Dimension Department was created in the OSC mission to Skopje in 2013, but was finally consolidated in uh, 2016 with four umbrella projects. I'm going to highlight a few of um, our activities under these uh, umbrella projects. So within the consolidation of the Human Dimension Department, we created a long-term objective of the department, and then four specific outcomes uh, for each of the, of the four umbrella projects. I'm going to talk to you about some of the activities we do today uh, within the Human Dimension Department, which include tolerance and non-discrimination, strengthening of institutions, trial monitoring, and youth work. Particularly, particularly within uh, tolerance and non-discrimination, and as um, Fermin just mentioned, in the region, the hate crimes, hate speech, continue to be a, ma a major challenge for the countries to address. In that, we have uh, partnered up with not only uh, national institutions, but also with CSOs, civil society organizations, um, to address this issue, in that, that we have created, the mission created an, a phone app that is used throughout um, the country and it's available um, in Macedonian language, Albanian language, and as well as in English, and it contains um, guidance on how to report hate crime and hate, hate crime particularly, and information on how to, on what is hate crime and what is hate speech. In that sense, we also support the Helsinki Committee in the country in uh, monitoring hate crime and reporting back to ODIR uh, for that. Within, keeping within tolerance and non-discrimination, we of course have worked um, with the national institutions in legislative reform in creating the law on the prevention on, on discrimination. Also, we have been instrumental as a mission and continue to be in working to strengthen the Ombudsman Institution. Also, one of our flagship, I think, activities is the regional conference that we aim to, to, to have yearly on addressing tolerance and non-discrimination in the region. Further, in moving towards um, addressing strengthening of institutions or democratic governance, we aim to strengthen the capacities of central and local institutions to increase effectiveness adhering to OSC commitments and democratic governance principles. For example, we work with the State Election Commission through a long-term engagement to address cross-sectoral challenges, including fulfilling OSCE ODIR recommendations. In that, we're just finalizing um, a, an activity with the State Election Commission which addresses um, rights of persons with disabilities and polling stations. 
So we engage civil society, the SEC, and us in trying to address these issues. We work the, with the Ministry of Information Society and Administration, which in fact is the ministry in charge of public administration, to develop a more coherent and efficient public administration in the country. Finally, engaging with ODIR, um, we, we are re-engaging with Parliament um, and support to Parliament in the area of ethics and code of conduct, and to advocate for increased sy synergies between the Parliament and the municipal councils. As I mentioned, we also do trial monitoring and uh, support for the judicial reform in the country. Currently, we're working with the government in being part of this, of, and contributing to the strategy for judicial reform. One of the main, um, one of the main principal, uh, ma issues of the mandate of the OSCE is the social, co its social cohesion and in the advancement of the OHRID framework agreement. So through that, we believe that social cohesion is advanced through improved community rights realization and an increased integration in education and youth work. In that, we work with the youth in increasing resilience to prevent radicalization. So our interventions from the human dimension um, on CVE and, and CVE RLT are from the youth perspective, working with local youth councils and integrating CVE with, within that. We also work with youth um, on the promotional and awareness, prevention and awareness raising of countering trafficking in human beings. And in that, we have partnered up with uh, a CSO and hope to have a, an MOU with the Ministry of Education and Science where teachers can become defenders um, through, um, through specific and targeted trainings. Finally, um, we have Building Bridges, which is a, an XB of the, of, the, um, of the human dimension, which actually addresses the gap that exists between um, students in different languages of instruction. So basically, it is a grant scheme to schools, which the Ministry of Education and Science has now taken on board, so ensuring its sustainability, but ensu <coughs> ensures grants to schools so that this language gap can be bridged. And in conclusion, um, we work with the Ministry of Education and Science, as I said, to facilitate dialogue on integrated education and addressing the challenges that that may bring. The OSCE was instrumental through the High Commissioner of National Minorities, and Max van der Stuhl, in the establishment of the Southeast European University. And to that, um, we believe and continue to believe that the Southeast European University is a fora which represents the values that the OSCE uh, represents and the commitments it stands for. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gonzalo. For what I think it's a very good uh, bird's eye uh, view of the work that uh, your team is doing in, in, in Skopje. So thank you very much for that. And then I would like to move on uh, to the mission uh, in Serbia. And we have with us uh, Jan Luneburg, um, head of the democratization department. I'm very happy to pass the floor to you, Jan. Thank you very much, <coughs> dear excellencies. Um, my colleagues gave <coughs> some concrete examples of successes in the past, and I will, uh, I will concentrate on some key generic aspects on how we implement actually your commitments. And these lessons learned are based on uh, almost 20 years of work with the field operations. Don't worry, I took some breaks in between, so I didn't violate the 10 year rule. Um, and they are shared equally, and these observations are shared by lots of colleagues and actually derive from a lot of work with my colleagues. These are just some examples of current and past cooperation of our mission with the ODIA. Uh, everywhere where there's a star, there's also a regional component to it. So keep that in mind when you fund ODIA, and I refer to Marcin earlier this morning, uh, when you fund ODIA, you co-fund field operations for an unbeatable cost-benefit ratio. And I would really like to underline what Martin said this morning in a side event there. I will take now two of these uh, initiatives. 
for these two lessons learned. Sometimes we don't know when. And it's funny that uh, Gonzalo also mentioned that you are now re-engaging on the Code of Conduct because we have been involved in this since 2012 when we first developed together with the ODEA a draft. And then we wrote in our, in our 2013 UB, we will support the finalization and implementation and nothing happened. And we wrote it 2014, 15, 16, 17. By that time, you probably sitting in the ASMF thought, how many codes of conducts do these people in Serbia actually have? Well, we don't have one yet, but hopefully we will have one uh, this year. But uh, since this required a political consensus between all Caucasus, it took that long. And you sitting in the PC, I guess you know how difficult it is sometimes to reach a political consensus. Uh, it takes some time. In the end, it's worth it. Second lesson. Uh, sometimes we don't know where we get, but uh, the way there is already an achievement. And in this case, it's a dialogue. It's a meaningful dialogue, for example, also jointly implemented with the ODEA. Getting together influential, active, motivated women promoting peace and stability across the region. There, among them are government, opposition, CSOs, and we brought them together in the first meeting in Budva in September this year. We don't know where it will end but we think it's worthwhile supporting as long as we keep the dialogue going and uh, follow us. I guess this initiative is known to, to quite a few of you. Started similarly, so give us, give us the time to develop something even if we don't know where, where it will end, but if we think that it's worth pursuing. Now I come to what we need from you as participating states, all of us. We need stable funding, and I don't mean XB, the XB is the icing on the cake. We need reliable UB funding, preferably at the beginning of the year and not sometime in the middle, because this gives us the flexibility to develop the initiatives, which ultimately then can also transpire into, into full-blown larger XBs. We need time. Sometimes it takes years to do something. You have to give us the time to find out whether something works or not. And that can, most, in most cases, not be achieved in one budget cycle. And, ladies and gentlemen, you need skilled and dedicated staff. And I would like to refer here also to the ODEA director who said this morning, please continue to second. I would subscribe to that. But I would also say, please uh, establish conditions that are attractive for secondment or that people can actually sustain on that. And the uh, recent developments, for example, when it comes to BLA, are a little bit worrisome. I can understand if you want to bring down staff costs, but we would, and we would all have full understanding for that if you communicate that in a transparent way to us, but don't hide that into a methodology as now applied, which uses an index-based US dollar system uh, and doesn't have anything to do with the real costs in the duty stations. Ladies and gentlemen, with your field operations and your institutions, because what I said applies to institutions as well, I think, uh, you have fantastic <laughs> tools at your hand to implement the, co the commitments that you commonly agree on. Care for these tools, and I think jointly we can do a lot. We cannot do wonders, but sometimes we think we're getting close. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan, for um, a slightly alternative approach uh, to the presentation, and I think that's a good note uh, to end with, with a more direct address to, to you all. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, the last presentation, because we have not been able to um, reestablish the connection with the program office in Astana. Um, um, it's a shame. I mean, they would have had um, a presentation on, on their work on uh, prevention of torture and a national preventive mechanism, but maybe we can distribute uh, the, the presentation um, to you anyway uh, after this session. So with that, so we, then we have reached the end um, of our presentations. We are then ready to, to open the floor. Uh, we have only three speakers uh, on the list. We also have not very much time left, so I think um, that we're perfectly on track. We can give uh, each speaker um, four minutes. Um, and with that, I would then uh, give the floor first to the Ireland on, on behalf of the European Union to be followed by the Russian Federation. Um, Ireland, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, the following participating states have aligned themselves to this statement, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Liechtenstein, Norway, Moldova, Georgia, Andorra, and San Marino. I'm conscious of uh, prevailing time constraints, I will confine the statement to uh, recommendations. Um, the 2017 
OSCE Unified Budget was adopted on 1 June, while that for the previous year was adopted on 31 December 2015, the six month delay in the adoption of the 2017 OSCE Unified Budget is regrettable. Timely adoption of the OSCE Unified Budget is imperative to ensure that the executive structures of the organization are able to plan and execute their activities in an efficient and effective manner. Participating states should avail themselves of the services offered by the OSCE executive structures in enhancing the implementation of commitments, including by facilitating visits and monitoring missions. EU member states have benefited from such assistance on a range of issues, and we will continue to do so. Executive structures should continue to coordinate closely with each other and with other relevant international and regional organizations, such as the Council of Europe and the United Nations, in order to learn from each other's experiences, avoid duplication, and to deepen the impact of activities. When designing projects and activities, the executive structures should develop close cooperation with civil society and increase their participation in the implementation phase. There may be scope for pathfinder projects to illustrate a particular issue and set an example. And finally, executive structures should continue to improve the monitoring and evaluation of their projects from conception through to completion, including by prioritizing the use of key performance indicators and implementing results-based management best practice. A fuller statement will be made available. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is the Russian Federation, uh, to be followed by Ukraine. Uh, Russian Federation, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, moderator. Colleagues, this year's discussions at our meeting have once again identified a range of problems that have accumulated in the area of the human dimension in uh, the OSCE area. We have repeatedly addressed the issue of a lack of transparency in the executive structure of the OSCE. We must remember the executive structure was created as an instrument to assist participating states to meet their commitments. We cannot allow the executive structure to depart from the decisions of the decision-making bodies of the OSCE, nor can we allow the hidden agenda in its work. Um, so not providing, for example, full information about the activities of the executive structure. It must abide solely by the approaches emanating from the consensus amongst participating countries. Work to bring positions together and not intensify opposing views. We need equal attention given to all areas of responsibility of the OSCE. And any project needs to respect the principle of a demand-driven approach respecting the needs and requirements of participating states. It's also necessary for these interests to be clearly reflected in the institutes and uh, executive structure of the OSCE, who must not impose different projects, but rather assist participating um, states and receiving states. Furthermore, uh, projects must be entirely consistent with the structure which is carrying them out. Any activity must be aimed at achieving clearly defined outcomes, otherwise there is a risk of wasting resources. It does not make sense also to distinguish between budgetary and non-budgetary projects because they are all carried out under the OSCE flag, our shared organization, and that means they are being carried out on behalf of all 57 participating states. Project activity needs to be based on the principles of transparency and accountability, and particularly and primarily that relates to non-budgetary activities of the OSCE. Uh, formalism here is not 
acceptable and transparency must be consistently observed. Our organisation has made a decision on the budget for 2017 and it was confirmed that the field activity of the OSCE would be reported upon to participating states twice a year on all non-budgetary activities. On a, uh, and that would be carried out on a regular basis. We must insist that the rules of transparency apply also to the institutes, institutions of the OSCE. Our organization has significant reserves to increase the effectiveness of its work, both with regard to striking a thematic balance and a geographic balance. That means a broader and fairer approach to the whole Euro-Atlantic area. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much. Um, the last speaker on the list um, is Ukraine. Ukraine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I will uh, uh, deliver a shortened version of the statement. The full text will be uh, circulated in writing. Mr. Moderator, I would like to begin by acknowledging the direct connection between the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms and genuine lasting peace and security in the OEC region. In this connection, we are convinced that the OEC needs to have strong institutions in order to effectively fulfill its functions. We strongly support the work of the three OEC autonomous institutions, ODIR, HCNM, and RFOM, and consider them as one of the OEC's greatest assets. Distinguished colleagues, protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms, ensuring the rule of law, promoting principles of democracy as well as protecting democratic institutions and free elections, are at the core of the OC concept of comprehensive security, and I note with satisfaction the cooperation between my country and ODIR in this area. At the same time, we encourage the ODIR to use its mandate and available instruments to contribute to full implementation of the UN General Assembly Resolution, Situation of Human Rights in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the City of Sevastopol. We encourage the ODIR to use its assets to carry out human rights monitoring in the Crimean Peninsula illegally occupied by Russia, and again urge the Russian Federation to remove all impediments for access and permanent monitoring in Crimea by international organizations. Ukraine is confident that the High Commissioner uh, on National Minorities should further play a key role in identifying and addressing short-term triggers of inter-ethnic tension as well as long-term structural concerns. Ukraine's most concern is the growing repressions, serious human rights violations, and discrimination against the Crimean Tatar national minority and ethnic Ukrainians in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. We encourage the High Commissioner to take as a matter of priority the issue of mass illegal detentions of persons belonging to national minorities in the Crimea, including the case of Deputy Chairman of the Crimean Tatar Majlis, Achtem Chegos, along with other Crimean Tatar activists. Strengthening freedom of the media, including the safety of journalists, is a priority for Ukraine. While reiterating our full support for the mandate of the representative on freedom of the media, Ukraine urges RFM to continue its monitoring of the media situation in the Crimean parts of Donbas, where the journalists face ongoing intimidation and threats, and the crimes committed against them remain without due investigation. Distinguished colleagues, we appreciate the role of the OC as part of international efforts aimed at assisting Ukraine's government in pursuing the reforms, many of which strengthen the national level, at the national level the implementation of the OC commitments. We cooperate closely with the OC institutions and uh, field presences. In this context, I wish to highlight our close interaction with the project coordinator in Ukraine in implementing projects in the uh, third dimension, offering training and psychological support to people in conflict-affected areas, promoting the safety of journalists, improving election legislation and proceedings, promoting partnership and dialogue between Ukrainian central authorities and civil society, assisting judicial reform in Ukraine, and improving citizens' access to justice, providing recommendations and expertise on law enforcement reforms, good governance, and anti-corruption. Our experience shows that to raise efficiency and effectiveness of the OC project activities in Ukraine, there is a need to, sh uh, to focus on the areas where the OC has a recognized expertise and which correspond to the security mandate of the organization, avoiding duplication of efforts with other international organizations. 
priorities and needs of the Ukrainian partners should be the main driving force in the development and implementation of project activity. We look forward to further fostering our cooperation and mutual understanding. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have reached the end of our um, speakers' lists. We have not received uh, any requests for... Oh, we do receive a request for a right to reply. Yes, moderator. We would like to take advantage of our right to reply, to respond to what we have just heard from the distinguished representative of Ukraine and once again to declare the following. Crimea is an integral part of the Russian Federation, which became part of the Russian Federation as the result of a referendum conducted in full accordance with international law. The right of self-determination of peoples is enshrined uh, in various UN texts and covenants. Uh, and uh, therefore, everything that has just been said by the distinguished uh, representative of Ukraine has been stated uh, uh, under his own conscience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there another right to reply? from Ukraine, okay? Ukraine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, I don't want, want to go into exchange on this subject where we know where we all stand. I'll just reaffirm that according to the Constitution of Ukraine and international law, the Crimean Peninsula, the city of Sevastopol, are the parts of Ukraine occupied by the Russian Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a few more uh, rights of reply. Uh, the next speaker would be Estonia. Estonia on behalf of the European Union to be followed by Canada. Canada. Yes, Estonia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, the European Union reiterates uh, its strong condemnation of the legal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol to the Russian Federation, and we will not recognize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now. Um, Next speaker, Canada, uh, to be fo we have another right to reply, followed by um, on the, the United States of America, sorry. Uh, Canada, the floor is yours. Thank you, very, Mr. Moderator, very briefly. Uh, we also, uh, once again, reiterate uh, that we do not accept the illegal annexation of Crimea and will not accept it. Thank you. Thank you. The United States. Uh, the United States wants to echo our colleagues from the European Union and Canada. We do not recognize and do not accept the illegal annexation and occupation of Crimea. We have reached the end um, of our speakers' lists, uh, so that's only left for me to, to thank you all for your, um, your observations and recommendations. We will surely take on board uh, the demand for increasing accountability and transparency and also an approach based on, on performance and, and key performance indicators. Um, we will definitely also learn from uh, the presentations to take the lessons learned on board uh, in the future, even more than we have tried to do in the past. Um, so with that, thank you all. Also, thanks to the interpreters who probably see the end in sight as well and are very grateful for that. We think we only have a very short uh, technical break before we move on to the, to the closing, just some rearrangements at, at the head table. Uh, so we will be able to move on to the closing session in, in a couple of minutes. So all, thank you very much.
We will be starting in a minute or so, ladies and gentlemen. Техническое соглашение, я не преувеличиваю, изменили мы мир. Это был необычный да. международный договор, не только по огромному числу стран, ну, которые его... Мои соблюдения.
ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the meeting, so please uh, take your seats. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it is my privilege to welcome you all to the closing session of this year's Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. Uh, as all of you know, ODIR organizes this meeting in close cooperation with the OSCE chairmanship. And it is an established tradition that the chairman in office kicks off the closing session with their remarks. Uh, the chairmanship is, pres is present today through this, its special representative, Ambassador Christian Strohal. And Ambassador Strohal happens to be one of my predecessor in, uh, as OT director and a true HDIM veteran. I'm thus very curious to hear his thoughts, and <coughs> Ambassador Strohal, the floor is yours. Well, I don't know about veteran, maybe voluntary recidivist is a more appropriate uh, description. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the kind words, and uh, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to look at these, uh, the, these two weeks. And um, I think if we look at these two weeks, the, the age team is a rare occasion in our organization once a year to look at how we are doing in reality. It is our reality check. Our principles, commitments, instruments, mechanisms, and tools are meeting reality. Reality as it is brought to us by civil society, first of all, but also by ODIA, the other institutions, and field operations, as we just had, a very impressive panel, also by our presenters and experts, and by us, uh, government delegates ourselves. This reality often has names, names of individuals whose rights have been violated. And such violations, in turn, often demonstrate a recurring or even systematic pattern. So our reality is rather varied. Good and bad, beautiful and ugly, successes and failures, challenges and achievements. And it's up to us to ensure that tomorrow's reality is better than today's. So we have discussed together a wide range of human rights and fundamental freedom issues over these two weeks. Freedom of expression, free media, freedom of peaceful assembly and association, freedom of movement, freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief, issues related to tolerance and non-discrimination, combating racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, intolerance, and discrimination against Christian, Muslims, and members of other religions, hate speech, hate crimes, issues related to the rights of persons belonging to national minorities, Roma and Sinti communities, refugees, migrants, displaced persons, the challenges of combating trafficking in human beings, ensuring equality of opportunity for women and men, and the list can go on and on. What they have together, these issues, is that the challenges and problems which have been raised in many intervention, interventions, particularly by civil society representatives, are truly alarming. As OEC chairmanship, we have carefully listened to all your points put forward in each and every session and we share your concern for the unrelenting challenges for the respect and full enjoyment of our universal human rights across the whole OEC region. And it is precisely for this reason that the HDM occupies such a prominent place in the global human rights landscape, a place which must be preserved and further strengthened. Regular critical dialogue among us is indispensable, all the more in such turbulent times. HDM is indeed one of the few occasions where we all come together from all corners of our region and all edges of society to inform and to be informed. It is an opportunity for us participating states, indeed an obligation, to review the implementation of our own commitments, to be assessed, to be held to account, and to be provided with best practice and tangible recommendations 
in order to ensure, uphold, and improve our overall human rights performance and access to human rights. It is also an opportunity for the NGOs to strengthen their networks, learn about the commitments, and engage with governments and with each other to share experience across borders. Failure to uphold human rights and the discrimination and marginalization of individuals or groups are factors that contribute to instability and insecurity, and even lead to conflict. On the other hand, many measures we see adopted across our region are intended to tackle security threats, particularly transnational security threats, but often as an effect have a further clampdown on our rights. In other words, we will not achieve sustainable security without the full respect for human rights. To relativize certain rights is not an option to enhance stability. This will be one of the key messages we should advance with and bring back home from this year's meeting. A second key message we have already emphasized at the end of the first week, all of us, governments, international actors, civil society, generally all people, need to come together to jointly guarantee that our universal human rights are protected and can be enjoyed for each and every one of us. Thirdly, we have been reminded of the importance of conducting and continuing our dialogue. Despite the many different views and perspectives we have in our region, it is important to come together with a constructive spirit towards a deepening understanding of each other's perspectives, but also for our common shared values, principles, and commitments. As chairmanship, we are fully committed to ensuring a continued dialogue on areas within the human dimension and the, its commitments. And finally, we believe that the calls of civil society organizations and many participating states to further strengthen our institutions must be taken seriously. And all of this needs systematic follow-up. So in a, way, in, in, in a way, the work only starts uh, once we get back home. And it was, of course, all of us participating states who had voluntarily signed up to the long list of commitments in the human dimension. Back, all back to Helsinki and Paris and so on. It was also us who mandated the ODIA, the RFOM, and the High Commissioner to monitor and assist us in the implementation of our commitments. We should be proud of these achievements and live up to them. We believe that we can all benefit from making the best use of the wide expertise offered by the institutions. We thank all of them, especially as they are all now under new stewardships. It's a recognition of the high quality of our four new captains that it seems they have been with us for quite some time while they have just started in their functions. But it is not for this reason, of course, uh, that the preparations for this year's HDIM were not without challenges. As previous chairmanships, we have been faced particularly with the very late adoption of the relevant decisions. This continues to represent a challenge for ODIA as well as for the chairmanship in preparing for the HDIM. And of course, we are still ahead of our annual Human Dimension Seminar and the SHDMs. We hope that such challenges can be overcome in the future. Indeed, they must be overcome. This year, the ODIA, with full support from us, have introduced a series of innovative measures which we believe have helped to give the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting more structure, ensure more meaningful and pluralistic debates, and help us to meet our own personal obligations. I'm convinced that I speak uh, on behalf of everyone here. Those that have attended the HDM of the last two weeks here in Warsaw and also those who followed in online. In conveying our sincere gratitude to Director Gisla Dottier and the entire ODIA staff. They have responded with the vigor we have been accustomed to, to our very late decisions. Our gratitude also goes to the host country, Poland, for their active support and in finding a new venue for this year's uh, HDM. Let me also thank all other colleagues who have been working behind the scenes and made this conference possible. 
And allow me to conclude with a personal uh, word of thanks uh, to the chairmanship team. Uh, I wish you all the best, good luck, and finally a safe return home to the work ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Strohal. Uh, before I give the floor to the delegation of our participating states, I would like to share my own thoughts about this year's H team. As the meeting is now coming to an end, I think it is fair to say that these were two extremely intense weeks uh, for all of us. We're looking back at two weeks of hard work, of concentrated and sometimes controversial debates, two weeks of interesting side events, two weeks of cheerful social gatherings, and above all, two weeks of exchanging extremely diverse opinions and ideas. I will refrain from reporting on individual working session, as most of you will be able to listen to my report to the Permanent Council on October 5th in uh, Vienna, where I will give you a more in-depth overview of the discussions we had during these sessions. We will furthermore, as per established, uh, per established practice, provide the delegations with written reports in hard copy and present them to our webs on our website for everyone interested to see. But I would nevertheless like to stick to the good tradition of reporting on some of the statistical highlights of this year's H team. At this 21st Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, we had around 1,300 participants, including government delegations from 53 participating states. We also had an impressive number of almost 700 representatives of civil society, and moreover, I'm happy to report that overall, we almost reached gender balance in our participa participation. Uh, finally, a remarkable number of 88 site events were organized in the margin of this H team, addressing a very wide range of human dimension topics. I would like to thank, take this opportunity and thank all those who have organized site events for this year's H team, thereby contributing to making this meeting even more diverse and also more interactive. The site events have over the years become an integral and increasingly important part of H team, thus allowing, in the spirit of the Helsinki document, for an increased openness for NGOs and civil society. While it's important to note that we do not endorse or support any site events unless we are explicitly taking up the role of organizers, of the organizers, and that we have even occasionally fundamentally disagree with some of the views expressed there, uh, we are still convinced that this openness has its merits and that it is an end in itself to listen to other people's views. We do expect, however, that the organizers of site events respect our openness and hospitality by ensuring that all discussions remain civil and constructive. As all of you know, H-Team, as such, is a rather formal affair. We are all bound by rigid modalities anonymously decided upon by the OSCE Permanent Council. While these rules may seem strict at times, I believe that they serve an important purpose. Each team was created to review the implementation of our participating states' human dimension commitments. The commitments that your governments have made for themselves in order to improve the lives of their citizens. The fact that the NGOs and civil society have the opportunity to contribute to this review and participate at each team on an equal footing is a unique and extremely valuable feature of each team. It is impossible to discuss the state of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the OSCE region without criticizing governments. This criticism is rarely pleasant, and we all know that we do not like to be criticized. But it serves an important purpose to improve the state of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the entire region. And because this purpose is so important, it needs to be protected by our modalities. I can assure you that in preparing the meeting, we are doing our best to apply these rules in a way 
to always serve, serve this very purpose in the best possible manner. Striking the right balance between an open debate and an orderly and constructive conduct of the meeting isn't easy, and we are always ready to learn from our experiences. This year, we introduced some new measures reflecting the ever-changing needs and challenges in organizing such a large and ever-growing meeting. But we cannot change the modalities which you as participating states of the OSCE have given yourselves in an unanimous decision. In this light, it was particularly painful for me to see that not all participating states were present at this year's uh, meeting, and that one delegation decided to leave the meeting during the opening session. But I have to insist that I cannot change the modalities that clearly calls for the, and I quote, broadest possible participation from civil society organizations, and I unquote. This broad participation gives you, as the OSCE states, a unique opportunity to listen to opposing views, get direct feedback, and draw your own conclusions. This is the strength of the human dimension of the OSCE. Dialogue and discussion, sometimes controversial debates, but a common understanding that these are always firmly grounded in the framework of our unanimously agreed human dimension commitments. Commitments based on human rights and fundamental freedoms, which are neither Eastern nor Western, but universal by their very nature. The groundwork of this spirit that was laid more than 40 years ago in 1975 with the Helsinki Final Act. With the words of Ludmila Alexeyeva, the legendary co-founder of the Moscow Helsinki Group, whom we heard at the opening session two weeks ago, and I quote again, it is no exaggeration to say that the Helsinki Final Act changed the world. And while the world has indeed changed a lot in the last 40 years, and improved in many ways, there is still a lot of work to do. In the past two, two weeks, we have received an excellent overview of the state of implementation of our human dimension commitments. We now know where things still require change and where they can be improved. But the real work, the implementation, only starts here. I now would like to invite the delegations of participating states for their closing statements. But I also want to mention here that at the very end of the session today, a uh, presentation of the full video statement of uh, Ludmila Alexeyeva, which I had just quoted, uh, which we couldn't show at the opening session in its entirety, due to technical difficulties, will be, uh, display, will be shown. The statement will be shown with uh, English subtitles, but it will also have simultaneous translation in the different uh, languages, and it will also be available on our website. And I just want to reiterate my apology for, for the technical problems we had in the opening session, and I hope we have done justice to her important statement by, by doing this at the final session. Uh, thank you for your attention, and now I open the floor for uh, delegations to deliver their closing statements. Uh, and they have five minutes each to deliver their, their statement. First, I have on my list Estonia on behalf of the EU, followed by Romania. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, the European Union would like to thank the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, as well as the Austrian OSCE Chairmanship, for organizing another valuable human dimension implementation meeting. We also wish to thank Poland, which has once again kindly hosted this meeting. HDIM is the most important event in the OSCE human dimension, providing a unique platform for discussing challenges to the implementation of the human rights commitments participating states took upon themselves. HDIM is an opportunity for all of us to be held to account in relation to our OSCE commitments. 
The European Union and its member states have listened carefully to the concerns and recommendations directed at us. We acknowledge our own challenges and shortcomings, and we remain committed to addressing them and to continuing a genuine dialogue with independent civil society. It is an essential partner for the implementation of human dimension commitments. We regret that some participating states chose to leave, as is the case of Turkey, or not to participate at all as Tajikistan and Turkmenistan at the 2017 HTIM. We reiterate that by not participating in HTIM, these states missed a valuable opportunity for an open and frank dialogue with other participating states and civil society. We hope that their decision not to participate in HTIM 2017 is not a sign of a diminished will to engage in the human dimension and the OSCE. We thank the human rights defenders, representatives of civil society and journalists who have actively engaged in the discussions. Some of them gave worrying testimonies of their experiences and the situation they face in their respective countries. We commend their courage and we reaffirm our constant commitment to support and protect human rights defenders. Their work and independence should not be restricted. Participating states should not use supposed non-governmental organizations to promote government views. They discredit independent voices and distract attention from real, real issues and challenges. The negative trends observed in Central Asia in recent years persist. Erosion of the rule of law, restrictions on civil society, and limiting of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Against this backdrop, we welcome the increased engagement this year from the delegations of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. We hope that their engagement marks a renewed commitment to human rights and fundamental freedoms. We remain deeply concerned by the downward trend in respect for fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression, association, and of the media in Russia. We welcome the first hand testimony of the many civil society actors affected by the actions of the Russian authorities. The EU remains worried about the situation of human rights and fundamental freedoms in Belarus and is increasingly concerned by the deteriorating situation in Azerbaijan. We're also seriously concerned with the growing number of arrests and imprisonments of journalists in Turkey and the increasing restrictions imposed on civil society and human rights activists. Within the OSCE region, areas affected by armed conflicts are more vulnerable to violations of human rights and disregard for the rule of law, grave situations of ill-treatment in detention, widespread impunity, disinformation campaigns, to mention just a few. Let us touch on two areas that have received scrutiny over these two weeks. In Ukraine, we remain concerned about the human rights situation in areas held by Russia-backed separatists, in particular the use of arbitrary detention. We repeat our grave concern over the ongoing persecution of national minorities in illegally annexed Crimea, particularly the Crimean Tatars, and of human rights defenders, lawyers, and journalists. We restate our strong condemnation of the illegal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol by the Russian Federation, and we will not recognize it. We remain concerned about discrimination against ethnic Georgians residing in the Georgian regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In this regard, the European Union reiterates its firm support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Georgia within its internationally recognized borders. In conclusion, we reiterate our full support for the work and the mandates of the SCE autonomous institutions as key assets of the OSCE. We are confident that under the newly appointed heads, they will continue to play a proactive and independent role in promoting human rights and democracy, true to the comprehensive approach to security that is the hallmark of the OSCE. We call on all participating states to recognize the very important role the USC autonomous institutions play and resource them adequately to allow them to carry out their mandates. Allow me to add that the list of aligning states will be attached to the written statement that will be made available for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next on my speaker's list is uh, Romania, followed by Switzerland. Romania, the floor is yours. <clears throat> My name is Mircea Simeon. I'm Minister Counselor with the Embassy of Romania to the Republic of Poland. Madam Chair, thank you for giving me the floor to deliver a statement on behalf of Romania. I'd like to refer to the new law on education adopted by the Supreme Rada of Ukraine on 5th of September 2017, more specifically to Article 7 of this law. While acknowledging the importance of reforming the education in Ukraine and the objective of ensuring a good knowledge of the state language, Romania considers that the text of the current Article 7 of the new law is reducing drastically the existing rights of the persons belonging to the Romanian minority in Ukraine as regards the education in their mother tongue. Romania regrets that the Article 7 was adopted despite the previous assurances by the Ukrainian side that the rights of persons belonging to the national minorities, including the Romanian one, will be preserved. 
Furthermore, Romania regrets that there were no genuine consultations with the persons belonging to the Romanian minority in Ukraine before adopting the current form of Article 7. During the recent bilateral commission on minorities, Romania-Ukraine, the Romanian side has asked the Ukrainian side to request the advice of the OSCE High Commissioner for the National Minorities and of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe before the promulgation of the law by the Ukrainian President. We do hope that these messages shall be taken into account by the Ukrainian authorities. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now I call upon Switzerland for, and then followed by Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Switzerland would like to thank you, Director Gisla Dottir, and your entire ODIR team, as well as the Austrian chairmanship, for all of the efforts that have been put in preparing and realizing this year's Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. We understand that due to a late adoption of relevant decisions, this was indeed a challenging task, and we therefore call on all OSCE participating states to demonstrate more constructiveness when it comes to adopting such decisions in the future. My delegation would also like to thank the numerous human rights defenders from all across the USC region, some of whom have traveled a long way to participate at HDIM in order to deliver their important message. Independent civil society voices are a reminder of the realities on the ground and important sources of information about human rights violations. Their participation at HDIM without fear of reprisals and harassment is therefore essential. Switzerland is, however, quite concerned about the tendencies to misuse the HDIM as a platform for spreading messages that undermine the mere values and principle of the OSCE. It is also regret regrettable that the focus of certain sessions where we would have all benefited from a real exchange of good practices and efforts undertaken to implement our commitments was ignored by certain participants. Madam Chair, the numerous side events offered us an additional opportunity for a more in-depth discussion on a broad range of issues. Switzerland was happy to share its experiences on combating anti-Semitism through education at a side event co-organized with the delegations of Romania, France, Germany, and the United States. And we look forward to the launch of the gui guidance document on the implementation of the Nelson Mandela rules for the treatment of prisoners that was presented at a side event by ODIR and Penal Reform International. This is a good example of, of ODIR's added value when it comes to strengthening the prevention of torture in the OSCE region. Madam Chair, as I already stated in my opening statement uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, Switzerland continues to advocate for moving the HDIM from September to spring. Let me come back to this point once again. We believe there is broad support for that idea. We would like to reiterate that changing only the timing of the Warsaw HDIM meeting is a purely procedural issue which would greatly benefit our joint work. It's better for our agenda that is overloaded in September. There is less international competition of other international human rights events. We have more possibility to attract international human rights organizations, and we have more time to prepare for ministerial council's decision and declaration. Therefore, we would like to invite the incoming Italian chairmanship to launch informal consultation for such a procedural change so that it can materialize by spring 2019 under Slovak presidency. This should give us enough time. And on top of that, I would say that prior, prior to these consultations, we should even envisage to get ministerial tasking for such consultations through a decision at the Ministerial Council in Vienna this year. 
We can already assure the Austrian chairmanship of our constructive engagement in trying to reach consensus on such a decision, as well as on any other decision or declaration in the third dimension. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. And now I call upon the Russian Federation, followed by Ukraine. Thank you, Madam Director, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. For a, num a number of years, a discussion of the most important issues in the human dimension at the Warsaw meeting has been characterized by severe politicization and confrontation. And despite that, there have been some uh, positive uh, steps, uh, thanks uh, to the efforts of the Austrian chairmanship in office. Uh, unfortunately, this year was not an exception. We are once again disappointed by the fact that many participating states uh, uh, insist on not uh, admitting that the objective reason for the serious crisis in the OSCE re region is the irresponsible and aggressive policy of the West uh, with respect to certain other participating states. Uh, we once again call on Western parties, uh, partners uh, to refrain from unpromising attempts to pursue their geopolitical aims by force and from interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states. Uh, the result of such a practice can be seen in the inter-Ukrainian crisis. The U.S., the EU, and Canada not only supported, but were even direct participants in the February 2014 uh, state coup d'etat in Ukraine with the use of force. Uh, the Ukrainian people are paying a very high price uh, for the advice uh, of highly placed Washington emissaries uh, and intermediaries uh, in the the position of certain European politicians uh, in the signing of the agreement uh, between the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, and the then op uh, opposition. The attempts uh, to persecute and eliminate dis uh, dissidents uh, and illegitimate decisions uh, on the punitive operation against the peaceful population in Donbass. Uh, uh, and for instance, uh, the uh, killing uh, in a fire of participants in a peaceful protest in Odessa on 2 May 2014 knows no analog in contemporary European history, and those responsible have not yet been brought to justice. So why are we not hearing from our Western partners uh, calls uh, to Kiev to bring an end to impunity for this crime? The glorification of Nazism and former uh, Nazi allies uh, uh, undermining the freedom of expression of national and international mass media journalists. Uh, uh, all of this have become everyday phenomena in Ukraine. The attempt uh, to drive uh, Russian language speakers into an ethnic ghetto is something that is becoming a deliberate national policy for now still teetering on the edge of uh, the horrendously notorious ethnic cleansing in other countries and regions of the world. As confirmation of this, you just have to look at the draft uh, law submitted in Ukraine, which essentially uh, amounts to Ukrainization by force and assimilation of Russian language speakers uh, and the representatives of other national minorities. Another worrisome tendency that we see uh, in Ukraine is uh, the attempt uh, by radical and nationalist uh, circles to interfere in the activities of religious organizations. There is a tremendous pressure being put on the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Its leaders and adherents are almost daily confronted with uh, force, uh, hate, uh, and attempts to take over their temples by force. What is absolutely unacceptable from the point of view of Ukraine's commitments in the human rights defense area is uh, the draft law 4128 uh, on introducing changes in the Ukrainian law on freedom of religion and religious organizations and law 4511 on uh, the basic status of religious organizations whose centers are to be found in a state recognized by the Vyhovna Rada of Ukraine as an aggressive state because they both uh, undermine freedom of religious organizations before the state. Now, we hope that common sense will win the day in Kiev and that the authorities will hear out the many thousands of their citizens who have gone out into the street to protest against these discriminatory draft laws. Madam Director, in 1975, the Western countries, as one of their most important achievements of the CSCE Final Act, referred to freedom, the enshrinement of freedom of movement. Now, at the present time, our partners to the West of Vienna continue to stress uh, the uh, primary nature of uh, this uh, 
uh, freedom, uh, freedom of expression, also called freedom of speech. Now, is it not paradoxical that the U.S., uh, the EU countries, and their like-minded thinkers uh, are uh, taking advantage of the right to freedom of expression of the residents of Crimea as a pretext for collective punishment of the entire peninsula. I mean, this uh, freedom of speech uh, is such a high priority for them in the signing of the Helsinki Act. Uh, let me stress once again that the practice of limiting the right of freedom of movement of residents of uh, Crimea in terms of non-issuance of visas or non-recognition of Russian passports uh, issued in that region by Russia is openly discriminatory and is in full violation of the commitments taken on by OECD uh, participating states. Uh, Madam Director, I would like to draw attention also to the importance of recent attempts uh, to falsify and rewrite history. And in this respect, I would like to mention one of the most tragic uh, papers in the history of um, uh, the last century in Europe that we will be celebrating, uh, whose anniversary we'll be celebrating in a few days. On 30 September 1938, leading European powers uh, signed a terrible uh, agreement with Nazi Germany, which went into history under the name Munich Agreement. Uh, uh, and in that, uh, through that shameful step, uh, the old European democracies uh, untied the hands of the leadership of the third regime and opened the way uh, for the start of the Second World War. And the people of Europe uh, paid that uh, price uh, for that. Tens of millions of people died, uh, men, women, children, soldiers. Uh, and uh, to make sure that this does not happen again must be our main task. And in this respect, I would call on the US, Canada, the EU, including its Baltic states, States, uh, and Ukraine to review their position when it comes uh, uh, to the various acts of glorification of Nazism, marches of uh, Waffen SS uh, uh, veterans, glorification of collaborators and organizers and organizations such as the OUN and UPA, other phenomena, uh, manifestations of neo Nazism, radical nationalism, and other regressive ideologies. If I may, just uh, very briefly on a few organizational modalities of our meeting. Over. Uh, and in this respect, let me just express regret uh, that once again we are confronted with this practice uh, whereby uh, participating states are not given the possibility fully to express their views that was a characteristic of the entire meeting over these two weeks. We believe that this uh, practice is not acceptable. We hope that it will be changed. We hope that such changes will be introduced in the future. And uh, I would also just mention in closing that the full text of our statement will be made available to the Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to Ukraine, followed by Canada. Well, thank you, Madam Director and ladies and gentlemen. The discussions of this year's HGIM once again testified that the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting remains one of the main instruments for the effective monitoring of and promoting compliance with the Human Dimension commitments, including through the unique active involvement of civil society in the debates. I will certainly not dignify a parallel reality statement made by the Russian delegate who basically assaulted the every, each principle of the OEC. Nevertheless, I would like to say that the, this HDIM also once again highlighted the persistence of serious challenges to human dignity and security in the OEC region stemming from the very Russian aggression against Ukraine. One of the purposes of the meeting is to assess the effectiveness of existing mechanisms in the human dimension in view of uh, continuing deterioration of human rights situation in the Russian occupied territories of Ukraine and significant limitations for human rights in Russia itself. We consider it pertinent for all participating states to give serious thinking to what OEC mechanisms should be enacted to thoroughly assess the situation and develop new recommendations. Such step would reflect the interests of the OEC community in Russia's recommitment to the OEC acquis through practical and measurable action. We deeply regret that instead of moving towards 
correcting the violations, Russia used this meeting to continue spreading its propaganda and aggressive nationalistic rhetoric, as well as shifting its responsibility on others. Whereas online, the Russian authorities employ an army of trolls to create a parallel reality. At the, at the meeting, they employed scores of so-called gongos, funded and hired for the very same purpose. It seriously undermines any possibilities for a genuine and open exchange. We also wish to underline our rejection of any attempts by Russia to, to use OEC events for creeping legitimization of illegal occupation of parts of Ukraine's territory. This year, an individual who holds a position in the Russian occupying authorities in Crimea registered for the meeting under the disguise of an NGO. It's only through cheating that such individuals can materialize at the OEC meetings, further eroding the foundation of this organization based on the principles and commitments. We call upon the chairmanship and the OEC institutions to take effective measures to counter Russian deceits. To foster the OEC's relevance to the current global and regional security challenges, including in the human dimension, we have to decisively prevent further erosion of the decalogue of principles and make them well functioning in our relations. Since establishment, the OEC High Commissioner on National Minorities developed valuable sets of recommendations, comprehensively addressing respective issues, among them the Hague recommendations regarding the education rights of national minorities, the Ljubljana guidelines on the integration of diverse societies, the Bolzano recommendations on national minorities in the interstate relations. So far, these sets of recommendations have not been endorsed by the OEC participating states as their political commitments. I find it promising that today, including in this meeting, there are delegations who years ago opposed or ignored those recommendations and today raise and actually promote national minority agenda. And I think that it could be a good sign for opening a discussion and coming back to the set of the recommendations that have been already developed by the OEC. We stand ready to continue our open and constructive cooperation with the OEC institutions. The Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the Representative on Freedom of the Media, and the High Commissioner on National Minorities, and rely on their expertise and practical support of the efforts of the Ukrainian authorities in promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms, democracy, and the rule of law. Looking ahead to the Vienna Ministerial Council meeting in December, Ukraine is interested to work for deliverables in the human dimension, which can make a real improvement, including in the situations of occupation. In conclusion, let me express our appreciation to the Austrian OEC chairmanship and the OD director Ingeborg Solrun Ilsledotter and her team for the preparation of the meeting, and all those who contributed to the effective conduct of the meeting, including keynote speakers, introducers, moderators, rapporteurs, and of course, interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have on my list uh, the delegation of Canada, followed by the United States. Canada, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I must say I'm looking forward to having five minutes. Um, it has been a long uh, but very productive two weeks here in uh, Warsaw. Uh, we would like to firstly thank ODIR, the OSCE Secretariat, the Austrian Chairmanship, and the staff here at the uh, Narodovi Stadium for hosting the event in a professional and efficient manner. We would also like to thank the numerous introducers who attended the working sessions to share their expertise. We have valued the interventions by numerous civil society organizations who raised awareness and shared their views on human dimension issues of importance to us all. We believe that this HDM has once again proven its value as a forum for participating states to review the implementation of our joint OSC commitments in conjunction with civil society. Canada reaffirms its view that HDM presents a critical opportunity for civil society to voice their concerns directly to participating states regarding situations in the OSCE area, and importantly, to offer constructive criticism of and recommendations on areas where participating states can and must improve.
In addition to the working sessions themselves, our delegation was able to co-sponsor and attend numerous side events this year, which once again expanded on a range of important specific issues raised during the working sessions. Canada places great importance and value on the ability of CSOs and delegations to host, often in conjunction, such side events, and we were thoroughly impressed with the substantive and constructive discussions that resulted from them. The value of HDIM will only be fully realized, however, if members of the civil society are free to attend this meeting without fear of intimidation or retaliatory actions against them or their families. We know it was serious concern that we have heard again this year reports of such persecution of HDIM participants and their families. We applaud the courage of these individuals and groups who choose to speak at HDIM, and we deplore the retaliatory actions against them and their families and encourage all participating states to condemn such acts. Madam Chair, the greatest benefits of HDEM are achieved when all legitimate participants are able to speak and when all delegations are here to listen. In this regard, we deeply regret that some participating states decided not to participate in HDEM this year. We do not believe that this was a productive decision. Canada believes it is necessary to hear all criticism, even if it is something we dispute or do not want to hear, uh, as you yourself said so. Uh, the observations of the civil society are especially important since credible external review lends legitimacy to our commitments and their implementation. Participating states that choose not to be here are unable to respond to such observations, be it to accept criticism, explain their position, or dispute uh, information presented. We hope that these, those delegations that chose not to attend HDIM, HDIM this year will reassess their decision and participate in next year's event. While Canada strongly supports the inclusion of all civil society organizations at HDIM, we are firmly opposed to the inappropriate and disingenuous usage of space reserved for civil society by some participating states as a tool to launch attacks on other participating states. These so-called gongos not only take up valuable time during the sessions that could be used by credible civil society speakers, but they also contribute nothing productive to this exercise and are fully transparent to all other participants. Unfortunately, their use seems to be an expanding practice of a few uh, select participating states. These states fail to recognize that their use of gongos at HDM is, in fact, detrimental to their positions and serves only to under underline their lack of respect for the OSE and our joint commitments. We call on them to cease this practice moving forward. Finally, uh, Madam Chair, we must recognize, regrettably, that this HDM was used by some organizations to convey and promote bigoted and hateful positions towards Muslims and Islam. As was noted during the sessions, these intolerant and discriminatory views contradict OSC commitments made by all participating states, and we categorically reject them. Their appearance here at HDIM is yet further reinforcement of the importance of this gathering to ensure that we are all working in line with OSC commitments towards replacing such views in our societies with ones of acceptance and inclusion. Though not unexpected, the common theme of many of the side events that our delegation attended was the sobering fact that the human rights violation, human, sorry, the human rights of many uh, remain in a precarious state or are clearly being threatened or violated. We must all push back against such threats and violations wherever they occur. It is for that reason that we reaffirm once again our steadfast belief uh, in the need to embrace inclusion and respect for diversity and the protection and promotion of all rights for our collective security. Throughout the coming year, we intend to continue discussing and improving our implementation of our human dimension commitments through the regular activities of the OSC and ODIR, and we look forward to renewing this important exchange at HDM next year. Uh, and if you would allow me, uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, we'll just uh, put this instead of our right of reply, but uh, to uh, what the Russian Federation has just said, uh, we find it extremely ironic that the Russian Federation seeks to blame Western countries for the current difficult state of affairs and mistrust in the OSCE when the international community has clearly recognized Russia as the responsible party for the conflict in eastern Ukraine. We remind participating states that uh, the conflict, uh, that we are discussing this issue once again and have done so in almost every working session here at this HDM because of Russia. Russia's violation of Ukrainian sovereignty with its illegal annexation of Crimea and direct involvement in the conflict in Donbass. Canada reiterates once more that we do not and will not recognize the illegal annexation attempt and fully support Ukrainian sovereignty over Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And now I have uh, United States followed by Kyrgyzstan. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My delegation wishes to briefly share some parting thoughts. Uh, my full remarks will be circulated. First, OSC participating states must defend Helsinki principles and implement our shared commitments. There is really no other way to rebuild trust and ensure lasting security. Second, 
Russia's, Russia's military aggression against the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other states is antithetical to Helsinki principles. We will never accept Russia's occupation and purported annexation of Crimea. The Minsk agreements are the best way to end the conflict in eastern Ukraine while respecting Ukraine's unity, sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. The violence in Donbas is not a civil war or a frozen conflict. Russia arms, trains, leads, and fights alongside forces which would not exist without Moscow's support. Crimea remains a part of Ukraine. Abkhazia and South Ossetia remain parts of Georgia. And we support Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova in making sovereign decisions on pursuing closer ties with Europe. Third, Russia represses civil society members, independent media, and ethnic and religious minorities. And fourth, beyond Russia, serious abuses continue in many participating states. In Turkey, the trial of Jum Hiriyet journalists and editors grinds on. American pastor Brunson was swept up in the post-coup crackdown, as was Turkish-American science scientist Gulge. We call for their release and that of others detained for exercising their human rights. We welcome the release of Meymen Aliyev, the director of Turan, the last independent news agency in Azerbaijan. However, we call on the Azeri government to drop the charges against him and to lift travel bans against him and others. Over 145 people remained incarcerated in politically motivated charges. They should be freed without condition. The show trials in occupied Crimea, in Russian-controlled areas of Donbas, and in Russia itself are travesties of justice. Russia should release Meili's vice chairman Chigos and Umerov, film director Sensov, and activist Kolchenko, and all others prosecuted for peaceably opposing Russian occupation of Crimea and aggression in eastern Ukraine. In many participating states, the attorneys of human rights activists are targeted. In Tajikistan, the prison sentence of lawyer Yurov was recently extended to 28 years. Fifth, when fellow participating states, NGOs, or journalists criticize the human rights record of a particular government, this does not constitute interference in internal affairs. My government has at times been criticized here. We might not agree with the criticism, but we will try to respond in a serious way. Six, when states brand and prosecute individuals as violent extremists for peaceably exercising their human rights, they undermine the security they purport to protect. Rights must be respected to develop peaceful, healthy political processes that give people a stake in their own futures. Seventh, hate crimes are never justified against anyone, anywhere, for any reason. IHRA's working definition of anti-Semitism is a useful tool. We commend its ongoing use by ODIR. We encourage governments that have none done so to put it into practice. We remain deeply concerned about critical, credible reports of a brutal campaign against gay men in Chechnya. We ask the Russian Federation to clarify, is there an investigation into these cases and who is the investigative authority? Eighth. HDM's primary value lies in giving governments and NGOs a platform for open, wide-ranging exchange of views on how the human dimension promises are kept or broken and on the way states can improve. Limited session time should go to, to maximize the opportunity for governments and NGOs to do just that. And we oppose any changes that reduce NGO participation. <coughs> we should not reinforce attempts by Russia to legitimize actions that undermine principles for example, the bogus official from Crimea who registered as an NGO. We look forward to working with the new leadership of ODIR, RFOM, and HCNM, and we will continue to defend their independence, their mandates, and their budgets. Ninth, we welcome the Kyrgyz Republic's return to HDM. We regret that Turkey chose to walk out and that Tajikistan refused to participate because certain NGOs were not excluded. We urge them to re-engage fully in OSCE activity. 
We also strongly urge that Kosovo be allowed to take its place at the table. And tenth and finally, my delegation thanks the civil society activists who have participated in our discussions. Some of you took risks to come here. We are aware that some governments in Gongos stoop so low as to threaten you and your families, to silence you. Threats and reprisals against you and your loved ones contravene our OSCE commitments. Human rights defenders are at the heartbeat of the Helsinki process. We want to thank <coughs> Madam Director and her team for organizing this meeting, and we express our gratitude to Poland for so gracefully hosting us. Uh, thank you. And now I call upon Kyrgyzstan, followed by Armenia. Thank you very much, Madam Director, participants of the meeting. First of all, I'd like to express our gratitude to the Austrian chairmanship and the office for organizing the HDIM and also for the, uh, the Polish government for the hospitality. Uh, this is a very important event. It gives us the opportunity to uh, see a dialogue between representatives of government, civil society, cooperation partners, representatives of NGOs, and scientific and academic circles. We discussed our progressive practices and the scrupulous observance of of the OSCE. We have not dodged our own shortcomings and unresolved problems. Uh, we also saw some statements at the meeting which were politicized and they will stay on the conscience of those who gave them. The delegation of the Kyrgyz Republic was a high level one and that represents the commitment of our country to an active discussion of human rights questions and fundamental freedoms having these discussions with our partners and representatives of civil society. These statements that we have heard at the meeting reflect the fact that there are issues in all OSCE countries related to shortcomings in the application of human rights and fundamental freedoms. There is no doubt that these problems are relevant and the discussions were clearly impacted by the current global situation. There are also, individual questions on human rights related to improving the social situation in some in our countries. Uh, at the same time, the growth of radicalization and the growth of terrorism means that we need to take decisive steps to protect the rights and fundamental freedoms of, hu of those same individuals. The complexity and diversity of the problems shows that there could be no single answer uh, to the issues raised and that we need to take an integrated, multifaceted approach to improving the situation. The Kyrgyz Republic, in consistently fulfilling its international commitments, will continue to support all OSCE initiatives to promote human rights and freedoms. We believe that international cooperation in the area of human rights must recognize national and regional differences, taking into account historical, cultural, and religious aspects of countries. We openly support ongoing cooperation and collaboration with international organizations in the area of human rights on the basis of mutual respect. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Now I have Armenia, followed by the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam Director. I would like to extend uh, our gratitude to the ODIR, OEC Austrian Chairmanship, the Polish authorities and their ABLE teams for excellent organization of this year's HDIM and their warm hospitality. Our thanks go to the introducers for their straightforward and professional presentations. The discussions revealed once again that security and human rights are strongly interlinked, and violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms leads to security issues, including conflicts and crises. The delegation of Armenia took the floor at almost all working sessions on different topics, and the common point in regard to all themes was that human rights should be protected for all, regardless their nationality, ethnic origin, religion, or status of territory they live in. Second, national security or fight against terrorism should not be invoked to justify gross violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of religion. Human rights should be even more protected throughout all phases of conflict cycle. 
threat, people residing in conflict areas are facing a number of security threats, including risk of mass atrocities and displacement due to policy of some OEC participating states. OEC and its institutions have untapped potential of work in this field. The delegation of Armenia underscored the importance of close cooperation with the OEC executive structures and field operations in implementation of the human dimension commitments. We regret that closure of the OEC office in Yerevan hampered our cooperation with the OEC. Meantime, we would like to state that Armenia will find new ways of engagement with the OEC and will continue to implement its commitments in good faith. Like in previous HD meetings, we noted high number of government organized NGOs. Fake news and fake civil society created Carnival Fun House mirrors, where perpetrators of worst human rights violations became victims and the other way around. It is even more outrageous that this fake civil society tries to replace those who are currently behind bars. We understand that complete failure to comply with OEC human dimension commitments and lack of any argument in supporting their policies compel those participating states to distort and spoil dialogue in HDM. My delegation tried to show an example of engaging with all representatives of civil society, notwithstanding their critical remarks throughout the HDM and their support for certain actions which were not peaceful and led to unjustified human casualties. There is no alternative to dialogue, and evading dialogue by self-victimizing posturing is neither sincere nor helpful. We hope that discussions at the HD and recommendations set solid framework for the OEC Austrian chairmanship in considering possible MC deliverables. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And now I have United Kingdom, followed by Poland, that will deliver the last statement in, in this session. United Kingdom. Thank you. Madam Director, Ambassador Storhal, as you bring HDIM 2017 to a close, we all have much to reflect on. I fully subscribe to the statement delivered on behalf of the EU and its member states, and I will not repeat all the thanks already expressed, except to applaud the hard work of your teams preparing this conference. Madam Director, I would like to add a couple of thoughts, as much in my capacity as Chair of the OSCE's Human Dimension Committee as in my national capacity. First, I want to highlight the connection between HDIM, which brings together a wide range of civil society and governmental representatives, and the meetings of the Human Dimension Committee in Vienna, where diplomats meet for in-depth topical discussions related to our OSCE Human Dimension Commitments. Over the past nine months, the Human Dimension Committee in Vienna has discussed specific aspects of issues also considered here in the past fortnight, tolerance, hate crime, political participation, freedom of peaceful assembly, to name just a few. Secondly, I want to highlight the importance of engagement with civil society. In democratic societies, civil society organizations play an essential role in helping keep governments accountable. Strong independent civil society organizations also make a very significant direct contribution to the lives of individuals across the OSCE region and to the health and stability of our communities and our states. As we have seen so often this week, the key to tackling some of our most difficult challenges lies in trust and cooperation between authorities and genuine civil society. If I may quote Ambassador Strohel, the real work. I'm grateful to the invited civil society experts who have significantly enriched, enriched each of our discussions this year in the Human Dimension Committee. But today I also pay tribute to the civil society representatives be it activists, lawyers, journalists, or simply private individuals who have traveled to Warsaw this year to fight discrimination and injustice and to defend people and principles. Madam Director, as long as there is injustice or in unfairness in our region, as long as commitments remain unfulfilled or violated, as long as a changing world presents us with new or evolving challenges, there will be a need for these conversations between states and civil society that HDIM provides a forum for. Finally, Madam Director, you and other moderators this week have reminded us more than once of the need for respectful statements and interventions. 
It has indeed been deeply troubling to hear speakers use HDIM as a platform for views and language incompatible with the principles and commitments of this organisation and to attack the legitimate rights of others. Upholding freedom of expression and maintaining the open and broad nature of HDIM whilst not allowing prejudice nor the fostering of hatred is a challenge that we must all meet together. Madam Director, I have listened to many discussions over the past fortnight and for me the best I heard involved speakers with very different backgrounds and very different perspectives discussing sensitive issues with a critical but respectful audience and that for me is what HDIM should be about. I look forward to working with you over the coming months in support of the important work of ODIR and as you plan with the chairmanship for next year's HDIM and other activity in the coming year. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then I have I call upon uh, Poland to deliver uh, the final statement. Thank you, Madam Director. Poland aligns itself with the statement delivered by the EU. But additionally, I would like to share with you some remarks from the perspective of the host country for ODU. First, we would like to comment the work and commitment of ODU's team and you, Director Gisa Dottir, personally, for making this conference run as smoothly as ever. Once again, Audir has proved its expertise and excellent organization skills in spite of different challenges, including the very late adoption of the decision of HDIM this year. As Audir a uh, host country, uh, Poland is particularly concerned with obstacles that the office encounters while fulfilling its mandate. In this context, we hope that next year it will be possible to reach consensus on dates and topics of HDIM much sooner to render the process of preparations much more predictable. Such a course of event, events uh, will permit to ensure a high level of our debates, early inviting experts, and to take care of all the logistic aspects of such a large event. Poland is glad to notice that this year's discussions during working sessions were focused mostly on real human rights issues, and we hope that this trend will rise and we as we need to work together to face the growing number of human rights challenges. We are also glad to see that IGDIM is still an event of major interest of civil society from all parts of the OSU region. This has always be, been a characteristic of IGDIM and we hope that it will stay this way. Therefore, we have tried to facilitate access to the meeting, in particular by facilitating visa procedures for IGDIM participants. Poland has been and will remain a staunch advocate for human rights. We pursue the goal of protecting the rights of this, uh, those most vulnerable, including children, religious minorities, or human rights defenders. We should always keep in mind that human rights is about protecting the rights holders and victims. This is our primary duty as participating states. We believe, believe that a lot is being done uh, in this regard, but plenty more can still be done. We are convinced that the different organizations active in our region should work together more effectively, creating synergies. We welcome close cooperation between the Council of Europe and the OC, and we believe that further enhancing of the cooperation can deliver even more spectacular results than they have done so far. Uh, with this in mind, Poland has organized for the second year in a row a meeting of directors from all OSC participating states, uh, which saw also the participation of representatives of Council of Europe, OSC and EU. We tried together to identify possible areas of closer cooperation between organizations as well as between participating states uh, with a view of advancing uh, the cause of human rights. We hope that such initiatives will contribute to our common goal of improving the human rights situation in the OSC area and beyond. Poland would also like to commend uh, the OSC Austrian chairmanship for their efforts to maintain human dimension at the heart of OSC agenda. We look forward to fruitful cooperation with Italian chairmanship in 2018, and we would like to ensure our Italian colleagues about our full support, including with regard to OSC events organized in our country. Thank you to all participants, and we look forward to hosting you all next year in Warsaw. Dziękujemy i do zobaczenia. Thank you and see you next year. 
Thank you, uh, Poland, and allow me also to use this opportunity to, to thank uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for excellent cooperation in preparing this uh, meeting. Uh, this was the last statement in this uh, session, but three uh, delegations have requested the right to of reply. I have Italy, Russian Federation, and the United States. Uh, and each of them have uh, uh, one minute. Italy, yeah. Italy. Grazie, signora direttrice. Thank you, madam director. Now, in the name of the future Italian chairmanship in office, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to thank, oh dear, the Polish authorities um, and uh, for the excellent organization of HDIM 2017. And thank you very much for your offer to give a helping hand to the future Italian chairmanship in office. Uh, I've asked uh, for the right of reply in order to respond to uh, what was uh, uh, said about uh, Switzerland and the idea of moving HDIM to a different time in the year. Now, we've taken note of this proposal. Uh, in the best tradition of the OSCE, we are always open to discuss any proposal um, that might enhance the effectiveness of the organization in a spirit of a consensus and in full respect for the autonomy of the organization. Thank you. Thank you. And then I have Russian Federation. Thank you very much, Madam Director. I'd like to respond to a number of statements uh, that have been made in today's closing se uh, session. I'll be very brief. Um, firstly, with regard to the Republic of Crimea and uh, Sevastopol, I'd like to recall once again uh, that uh, Crimea joined the Russian Federation as a result of a referendum taken in full accordance with international law. The right of peoples to self-determination is in the UN Charter and in the international, um, international text on human rights. The right of um, people to self-determination is uh, in international uh, agreements, and it is one of the primary ones referred to uh, before other human rights. Uh, with regard to the solution to the current crisis. Uh, the solution is the application of the Minsk Agreement, so we would encourage all parties involved uh, to fulfill their commitments with regard to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. These are two independent states, and we uh, call for the recognition of that reality with regard to the statement made by the US. Uh, we are welcome. We welcome the um, detailed lesson on aggression, uh, war, etc. Uh, but we would simply like to list a, a small group of countries: Libya, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, former Yugoslavia. Um, I could continue the list, but I think you already understand what I'm talking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then I have the United States, and then uh, the f final uh, request is from Estonia on behalf of the EU. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to exercise our right of reply in response to the Russian Federation. Um, the Russian Federation made a number of outrageous assertions during its uh, closing statement. Uh, we think uh, our closing statement addresses some of them, but we want to make one additional point. Uh, the United States uh, condemns the glorification of Nazism and all modern forms of racism, xenophobia, and related intolerance. However, we will not support efforts that deliberately distort history, are motivated by politics, and which call for unacceptable limits on the fundamental freedom of expression. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually have here also Azerbaijan. Thank you. In response to the intervention of the U.S. delegate yesterday, we addressed the issue raised in the statement. Therefore, please refer to the right of reply of my delegation on working session 17 yesterday. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then I have Estonia on behalf of the EU. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. The European Union reiterates our strong condemnation of the legal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol to the Russian Federation, and we will not recognize it. Moreover, the EU reiterates its firm support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Georgia within its internationally recognized borders. Thank you. 
uh, thank you. And then I don't have any other uh, uh, delegation requesting the right to reply. And this concludes this uh, working session. But we have uh, one more item on our session, which is any other business. And uh, I have one uh, delegation that uh, has, uh, wants to take the floor. It's the United States. The floor is yours. Thank you. As we have for many years, we're using this agenda item to follow up on the use of the Moscow mechanism. It is the participating state's responsibility to follow up on concerns which get rise to its use. Uh, in that regard, we regret that Turkmenistan did not participate this year. However, almost 15 years after the invocation of the Moscow mechanism, we continue to lack adequate information on many individuals who have been arrested by authorities only to disappear with no accounting of their fates or whereabouts. As we've heard from NGOs during this meeting, there are now at least 112 documented cases of such individuals whose fate is still unknown, including former OSC ambassador and foreign minister Bater Berdiev and former foreign minister Boris Shukmaradiov. We were moved by the poems written in prison by Berdiev and, they were and that were unveiled here at the HDIM. It is feared that many of those who have disappeared have been subject to torture and abuse or a worse fate. Their families have no information about their whereabouts or their health or whether they are even dead or alive. We call on Turkmenistan to allow access to these prisoners by their families, by their lawyers, and by international observers, such as the ICRC. In 2005, Foreign Minister Meridoff wrote the US, wrote US officials that all places of detention are open to visits by the representatives of the international organizations and foreign diplomats. And they are given free access to all persons in accordance with international rules. We urge Turkmenistan to make good on that promise and to allow us to visit those prisoners or provide concrete information if they are no longer alive. The Prove They Are Alive campaign reported that six individuals from the list have died in the past 18 months. This issue remains urgent. As we heard here, people continue to be arrested and incarcerated without information or access. Turkmenistan has committed itself to, quote, ensure that all individuals in detention or incarceration will be treated with humanity and to, quote, observe the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, as well as the UN Code of Conduct for law enforcement officials. We expect them to honor those commitments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have any other uh, delegation requesting the floor under this uh, item. So this concludes uh, uh, this item on the agenda. And uh, before we listen to the statement of Ludmila Alexeyeva, as I indicated here in the beginning of the session. I have one uh, piece of information for the delegations, but uh, I've been told that the summaries of uh, rapporteurs for working sessions 1 through 17 are already available in HTM documents distribution system. Uh, but the summary of, of working session 18 from this morning will be available uh, next week. Uh, and uh, with further ado, I think we should see this uh, the statement that will be uh, uh, with subtitles and also simultaneously uh, translated. And uh, that uh, statement, actually, that video concludes uh, this meeting, this HDM, the 21st meeting. Thank you. The Helsinki Accords really changed the world, and that is no exaggeration. It was a very unusual international pact or agreement, not only because of the number of countries that signed the Accords, because in the history of diplomacy, this really was the first agreement among states uh, whose fulfillment was resolutely supported and called for not only by politicians in power, but also by citizens of the countries that signed it. 
And this was because in the text of the Helsinki Accords, international security was linked to respect for human rights in all of the states that had signed the Accords. And it was this very idea of interlinkage that, which was born in the participating states, that really gave birth to human rights defense organizations in the USSR and countries of the Soviet bloc, because violations of human rights in those countries were truly an enormous challenge. And the first such organization arose in the USSR, namely our international Moscow Helsinki group. Its founder and first president, Yuri Fyodorovich Orlov, imagined and created this group on the basis of the humanitarian articles of the Helsinki Accords. Because these Helsinki Accord commitments had become a responsibility of the Soviet Union to fulfill on the basis of international control. Now, of course, the Soviet leadership hoped, not without justification, that if they avoid a fulfillment only of the humanitarian articles of the Accords, then the democratic states having signed the Accords would close their eyes to this non-fulfillment if the USSR just uh, releases uh, some of the best known dissidents, uh, uh, especially the Euro Jewish activists uh, who managed uh, to leave the USSR to go to uh, Israel. And so the task of the Moscow Helsinki group uh, was to achieve uh, fulfillment of the Helsinki Accords uh, in every respect, including the humanitarian articles. And there is reference to this in the very official name of the Moscow Helsinki Group, which was called the Public Group to Promote Fulfillment of the Helsinki Accords in the USSR. So how did we work to achieve this promotion of the fulfillment? We identified, revealed the cases of non-fulfillment of the humanitarian commitments of the Helsinki Accords right across the territory of the USSR, and we reported on such cases of violation to the governments of all of the states that had signed the Accords. Now, it might seem that that task of identifying all of these cases could not be fulfilled by such a tiny organization as the Moscow Helsinki Group. But we nevertheless had substantial success because we started to receive information of cases of violation from all sorts of religious, ethnic, and other organizations, and also from individual citizens who had learned of such violations. And we received such information from all corners of our enormous country. And the idea of basing action on the humanitarian articles of the Helsinki Accords turned out to be very fruitful for the USSR, where, in fact, uh, various Helsinki groups were formed and arose, not just in Moscow, but, uh, in fact, there were Helsinki groups that created in four other republics of the Soviet Union, namely Ukraine, Lithuania, Georgia, and Armenia. And then subsequently, they started 
to crop up in other states, uh, satellites of the USSR. And later on, even in democratic states that had signed the Helsinki Accords. The first one outside the Soviet bloc was in Norway, and then subsequently uh, one was born in the United States, in the Netherlands, in Canada, and in fact in many other countries. Now, these uh, Helsinki groups in the democratic states set themselves uh, the essential task of supporting Helsinki groups in the USSR and in countries dependent upon it because it was in those countries that uh, human rights activists were persecuted. So this really gave rise to an international Helsinki movement. And uh, this uh, movement covering North America and Europe really gave the impetus uh, for defense of the humanitarian articles. Now, the international Helsinki movement really broadened the boundaries of human rights protection. It gave impetus uh, to the influence, the notoriety, and the popularity of human rights uh, defenders, they made, it made, the movement made respect for rights of citizens and obligation for the governments of democratic countries, of countries that were striving to become democratic. And the movement even forced the authorities of those countries that wanted to be considered democratic to at least pay lip service to human rights and publicly to declare that they respect the rights of their citizens. And therefore, the Helsinki Accords really contributed to the development of a rights defense movement in all states having signed the Helsinki Accords. And they contributed to the unification of human rights defenders in the democratic countries of the West with their counterparts in the USSR and in countries of the Soviet bloc. The uh, international human rights movement uh, was quite rightly termed an international Helsinki movement. And I think uh, that that was really the main success, the main positive outcome of the Helsinki Accords. Now, is it possible today, 40 years later, to imagine something similar? Now, of course, under the present circumstances, such a movement would have to be a movement based on the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, because it is that convention that covers not only civic rights, but also social rights. And a contemporary international movement like the Helsinki movement must uh, seek uh, to bring in countries uh, where basic human rights are constantly violated and to bring them up uh, to the level of those countries of the contemporary world where the human rights situation is most positive, the democratic countries of the contemporary world. But in today's world, I think it is just as important to 
to help the populations of poor countries to overcome their poverty. And that can be just as important as respect for human rights. That is, it is important to deal not only with civic rights, but also social rights. Now, obviously, that is a very difficult task. Uh, to overcome poverty, to eliminate poverty right across the world uh, is uh, not something that can be done easily. And to achieve uh, success uh, will require years and years of effort, of serious effort. But it is only by solving both these problems it is only by solving both these problems that we can protect the world from war. And the more advantaged countries of the world from being uh, swamped by massive uh, flows of peoples uh, from countries where war is and poverty are raging. So like 40 years ago, Solving these grandiose tasks uh, is something that lies on the shoulders uh, not only of politicians and governments. For success uh, to be achieved, we need the united efforts uh, of citizens, of active citizens in all countries, uh, side by side with their authorities. And this must occur first and foremost within OSCE countries which have experience of such unification, of such joint efforts by politicians and civil, side, civil rights activists. This means that governments of those countries must extend support to civil society that seeks to achieve the same ends. And I make so bold as to hope that such solidarity of authorities and civil society is positive in a large number of countries. And I also make so bold as to efforts uh, to uh, ensure respect for human rights and overcoming poverty will, in fact, uh, give us uh, noticeable results, uh, albeit perhaps uh, not tomorrow. Because uh, in its uh, time, massive uh, success uh, was achieved by the minuscule Moscow-Helsinki group, which set itself uh, a task that might have seemed impossible to fulfill namely to force the USSR and countries of the Soviet bloc to fulfill their commitments under the so-called third basket of the Helsinki Accords. And I think that this past experience of the Moscow Helsinki which ended in success, can inspire us today to hope that it is possible to succeed and to solve the problems confronting us today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think uh, these were very appropriate and uh, relevant closing remarks and uh, hereby the meeting is closed.